As I travel across America, one of my favorite methods of transportation to get around cities is by train. Now, a metro system isn't always available in the many places that we visit, but when it is, you know for certain I'll be jumping around stations. I'm no stranger to the metro as I grew up in New York City, and almost all of our tours across the five boroughs has been a subway series. We've taken the metro in cities like Boston, Philadelphia, and even across the country in Los Angeles. But one of the metro systems that stands out to me is the one in America's capital, the Washington DC Metro, a system I've visited plenty of times that services the whole DMV area. That's DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So I put my curious mind to work as I toured the neighborhoods of Washington DC. I'm Jose and I'm on a mission to better understand why Washington DC's Metro is called America's last great subway system. This is the metro system of Washington DC's Chinatown, one of many Chinese inspired stations across the country. It's partly what inspired me to dive into the history of the DC metro. When I visited other Chinatown stations throughout America, I noticed something different about the one in DC. The first thing was the distance from above ground to the actual train platform. In some instances, you have to take multiple escalators and it feels like an endless walk. The second thing was the design. Almost all of Washington's metro stations have a similar architecture. But to better understand the uniqueness of the DC metro, we have to go back to the beginning of the subway system. Our study begins across the Atlantic Ocean to England and the London Underground the very first subway system. The London Underground shares so many similarities to that of DC's Metro. The London Metro opened in 1863 and became the world's first underground passenger railway. Although it was the first of its kind, trains and above ground platforms had already been in service for over 60 years. The rapid growth that came from the Industrial Revolution led to thinking about a different rail archetype. London was growing at a rapid pace, which saw the increase of daily commuters to the city. Between the cabs, carts, and omnibuses, the roads were constantly congested. The city was experiencing an uptick in traffic. Charles Pearson, a member of parliament, began pitching the idea of a central railway station for London. Pearson wanted to create a system to be accessed by tunnels and would open up usage to multiple train companies, expanding current rail lines to further distances for commuters. And immediately after hearing Pearson's idea, the audience rejected it. <laughs> it sounded like a good idea. I don't know why they would reject it. England's parliament felt the project would be too expensive and be disruptive for the growing city. From Pearson's proposal in 1846, it took six years to gain enough capital for his vision to make headlines in 1852. Yes, Charles didn't give up. He was determined to usher in the future of London's transportation. Pearson formed the city terminus company and put a railway at King's Cross. At the same time, the Metropolitan Railroad Company was founded. The Metro Company pursued the idea of connecting Paddington Station to King's Cross, a two and a half mile stretch of rail that travels beneath London, passing below Park Square. Park Square opened in 1823, so you can guess why building the rail would be disruptive to the city. Both the Metropolitan Railroad Company and Charles Pearson's company took their ideas to Parliament. The Met Company's proposal was approved, while Pearson's idea was once again rejected. For the same reason, too costly and complex to build. So Pearson returned a year later with a shorter line that was finally approved in 1854. There's a lot of in-between politics that occurred during this period, but the full unveiling of the Metropolitan Railway came in 1863. The unfortunate part, Charles Pearson had passed away three months before the unveiling of his life's greatest invention.
Back in America, the metro system took off, and soon after, Boston, Massachusetts unveiled the very first metro in the States, a mile and a half trolley line that first opened to the public in 1895. Before long, underground subway systems popped up all over the country, including New York City, which boasts America's largest metro system at a staggering 299 miles of rail line. But Washington DC's metro wasn't unveiled until 1976, decades after many large American cities had already been operating with a metro. With so many commuters working in the federal area and the congested traffic of Washington DC's freeways, it was only a matter of time before DC developed their own subway system. Washington DC had been a system of private buses and streetcars as we still find in the repurposed DuPont Underground Art Venue. Plans for creating an underground metro in the Washington DC area began in the early 1950s as the city expanded its freeway system. The installation of a metro system came as a result of urban planning. By this time across America, most people were using cars for transportation, so city planners were tasked to create more freeways and highways. This further congested traffic in the Washington DC area, leading to an extensive period of politics and acquiring rail and streetcar lines to design a perfect system for the metro area. Many people have been involved in the project, dating back to as early as 1930s and even landing the desk of several presidents. But with so much changeover, Congress finally appointed architect Roy Chalk to oversee the development of the Washington Metro. He had to replace all streetcars with buses by 1963. In 1962, there was a proposal to develop a rail system in the capital. The newly formed institution called the National Capital Transportation Agency. This new system was challenged by the Highway Commission, which the rail planners lost, leading to a reduction of the original track proposal. President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the National Capital Transportation Act of 1965, which authorized the construction of 25 miles of rail track. By 1965 and 1966 respectively, both Maryland and Virginia had signed on, along with Washington DC, to create a regional interstate compact. This allowed the extension of the rail system to cross state borders. So in 1969, we enter the moment the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority broke ground. Washington DC has one of the most beautiful subway systems in America. And now that DuPont Underground has been decommissioned, we're left with this amazing subway station. So why is Washington DC's Metro considered the last great American subway system? Well, that's simple. It was the last one to be created in America. In doing so, the experience meant it would be grandiose. Chicago-born architect Harry Weiss was tasked with designing Washington's forthcoming rail system. Weiss had uniformity and security in mind when laying out his blueprint. Let's analyze the design of the Washington Metro. For the minor exception of some stations, the entrance to these hubs can become a long trail underground. Here at DuPont Station, it's a 188-foot escalator ride. I've mentioned this in a lot of videos, I'm terrified of heights. So if you look behind me... Yeah, I'm trying not to look back. But that's the story for a lot of these stations in Washington, D.C. Well, I'm here. Let's go. Let's go. I can finally move my feet. I, I, like I said, I wasn't trying to look back, but gorgeous subway station, by the way. We in Station in the DMV Metro Line contains the longest escalator in the Western Hemisphere a remarkable 230-foot-long escalator to get to the train platform. Jeez. Look at that. The deep descent to some of these metro stations is because of the different geography and topography of extending rail lines to three different territories. DC itself has a mixed geography of hills, and as we get closer to the core of the capital and areas like Arlington and Alexandria in Virginia, we start nearing sea level. Then, you have a station like Forest Glen in Maryland, 
it's such a deep station at 196 feet that you could only access the platform by elevator. Once we're in the station, we have to look at the design. The Grand Caverns, with its curvature, make up the uniformity of Weiss's blueprint. A contemporary art style with patterned ceilings focus on functionality. The walls are spread out from passenger reach to reduce the facing, like found all over subway systems in other great cities. I'm looking at you, New York City, and my second home of Philadelphia, and don't even get me started on Chicago. Hey, is that Kanye West? One of the things that many of these cities have done is turn the graffiti into beautiful art murals. The station is supposed to be one long, unobstructed design without any corners to hide or pillars to block the view. Just a long layout where you can see from end to end. There's also no direct sunlight throughout these stations, with the only lighting being on the rail track. If you look at these stations with the same eyes as someone who grew up in a city with a traditional metro system, it definitely looks futuristic in comparison, earning that moniker of the last great subway system. how congested the traffic is in DC, I highly recommend taking the Metro. A lot of these stations, they kind of look familiar, have the same design. I mean, they're gorgeous. That's why I say it's one of the most beautiful subway stations in America. I'm Jose, and I thank you for joining me on this deep dive to discover the origins of the Washington Metro. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and share. If you want to see more in the Capital Region, please stay tuned for the following video. Until next time.